right, good morning, everybody. Well, that's a little dramatic. I got Thanos there, right? Just kind of, I was here and then I wasn't. But uh, anyway, great message, great job from our media crew. Hey, good to see you guys this morning. And uh, let me take a moment to welcome our online community, still a portion of our church that joins us online every weekend. Uh, and then there's some people that just found us during this time of transition, and they've joined with us. And so we're always glad to have you guys with us as well. And we want to welcome you and want you to feel like you're a part of what we're doing here because you are. Uh, before I get into the message this morning, I, I made an announcement a couple of weeks ago that I had just finished a book. Uh, about weathering storms, and, and the staff told me the next day in staff meeting said the way you communicated that, it, it made it sound like you just read a book, and, uh, and I understand that in and of itself would be impressive for those of you that know me that I read a book and I wasn't just bragging. Uh, I was saying that I just wrote a book, and uh, we want to make it available to you today. It's about pastoring, uh, weathering life's storms. And there's a lot of great information in here. In the last 35 years of ministry, we've had a lot of opportunities to minister to a continual flow of, of hurting people. And in that time of ministry, we've learned some things, some principles from the Bible that will help you get through a storm in life. Uh, whether it's a financial storm, a spiritual storm, mental, emotional, or whatever. And not only how to get through the storm, but there's even some principles to help you on how to rebuild after the storm. How many know that's important as well? And so we made that book available to you. It's in the lobby. It's on the honor system. It's five dollars. Uh, this book normally sells for about a thousand, uh, <clears throat> but because of you, we just wanted to make it available out there. And you say, Pastor, what if we read the book and we don't like it? Do we get our money back? No. Um, <clears throat> But I can help you there. If you don't like it, I can show you how to repurpose it. Uh, if you've got a shaky kitchen table, you can shove this thing under the leg. And uh, for five bucks, man, I've solved your problem. So I'm here to serve you, whatever that looks like. Uh, and also I want to mention to you, Jonathan mentioned about, of course, next weekend is, is Easter. And we are excited because we're going to be together uh, on campus, which we were not able to do last year. Uh, but also we're excited because I, I believe, first of all, that's kind of what we're all about, right? That whole Easter thing. That's the cornerstone of our church and of every church that we have an opportunity to present Christ and talk about the resurrection of Christ. But I also think it's significant because I believe this year is going to be a reset as well. You know, when this whole pandemic thing started, a lot of people stepped back because of health issues, and I get that. I really do. In fact, one of the things that I said is, hey, you do you. You do what you need to do for you, and you take care of yourself. And I'm still fine with that. I just want to make sure I put this one word of caution out there is, is that if you step back because of health, don't let it become habit. And somewhere down the road, we want to ask you to kind of re-engage and, and get back into being the local church because this is where we fulfill our purpose and God does, does so many things in our lives. And so we really believe it's going to be a reset for our church and for a lot of people to just kind of get back fulfilling what God has called them to do. But this morning, we're going to continue the series called Don't Cancel Hope. Let's pray. God, I thank you for every person that is here, that is watching, that is just connected with us in some way. The Father, today that we hear not just a message, but we hear the voice of the Spirit. And God, we are encouraged, again, not just from a word, but we're encouraged from the throne of God just to be lifted up. And Father, that, that we're to use that encouragement, that hope inside of us as a, uh, as a witness to other people, that they can go through storms and survive because we did. The hope inside of us got us through that. So I just thank you this morning ahead of time, God, for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, I want to begin by saying and stating the obvious is that we live in a cancel culture both in the world and inside of our head. And I want to try to break that down. And first of all, let me try to describe what a cancel culture in the world is. It is an attempt to silence you 
for whatever reason. Maybe I don't like you. Maybe I don't like what you say. Maybe I don't like what you believe. And so I can no longer just agree to disagree with you. Now I've got to shut you down and shut you up. See, now I've got to marginalize you to where you mean nothing and you have absolutely no influence in your life. And let me just say, that's not a God thing. In fact, I will go as far as to say that is the borderline a demonic theology. That is a demonic way to believe because it is totally opposite of anything that Jesus said. In fact, Jesus said things like this, like love your enemy. Wow, that's radical. Pray for those who use you. Pray for those who despitefully come against you. Jesus said, be willing to go the extra mile. And if I can just say for us as a church, we're not here to cancel people or cancel culture. We're always going to be here to love you no matter what you look like, sound like, or act like. may not always agree with you, but we're going to continue to reach out to you and show you the love of God. So we have this cancel culture that we're not going to be a part of canceling people we're going to keep loving people but there's also this cancel culture in our head our mind sometimes it's the voices how many of you hear voices in your head right those of you didn't raise your hand you don't want to miss next week's service (laughs) liars or friars in the lake of no that's not we have these voices in our mind we have these voices in our head that speak to us Sometimes it's our voice. Sometimes it's the voice of someone else or something that was said. And, and a cancel culture in our head is, is, is are these defeating thoughts like I can't or God won't or it's impossible. Don't even try. See, a cancel culture in your mind is a negative outlook, a message of quit or an attitude of hopelessness, whether it's the voice of yourself that inner conversation that you have or the voice of others that's used to keep you broken and defeated. And that's why we say don't cancel hope. So here's the question. Why is hope so important? Listen to this statement. You can never rise any higher than the hope that is within you. Let me say that again because I want you to really process that. You can never rise any higher than the hope that is inside of you. In other words, if you don't think you can, then you can't. If you don't think God will, then he won't. So you've got to have this hope on the inside that life can be better. If you don't see a better future for yourself or for your family, you will never live a better life. So you have to have this hope on the inside of you. Jesus said this in John chapter 14 and verse 1. He said, don't let your hearts be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. Then he goes on to talk about the reality of heaven. But I like what he said here. Don't let your heart be troubled. Two things I I can, two things I can draw immediately, immediately out of that verse is one trouble is going to come. It's going to happen. You're going to face trouble. It's on the way. You say, Pastor, you need to be more positive. I will. I am positive. Trouble is going to come. You're going to go through some storms in life. Stuff happens. Life is real. I told you last week, you know, ships are made to sail on top of the water. Ships don't sink because of storms. Ships don't sink because of the water outside. They sink when what's outside gets inside. So storms are going to come. And the second thing I know is when it comes, Jesus said, don't let it in. I have a choice. I can either let this storm break me and destroy me, or I can have an attitude. I'm going to put my hope in God. No matter what comes my way, God's going to make a way for me. Can I just say this? The best way to keep trouble out of your heart is to keep your heart filled with hope. Here's an example. If you've ever gone to Bricktown, maybe for an event or for a ball game or, or, or something going on, and you try to find a parking place, good luck with that. And you're driving around trying to find a place to park, and they have these little signs that they put out that says, lot full, parking lot full. And what it means is, uh-uh. Don't even pull and don't even think about pulling in here. There's no room for you. We don't have space for you. We don't have room for you. We are full. You won't fit. And the best way to keep fear out and trouble out is to fill your heart with hope. So when it shows up, you just say, "Uh uh-uh, 
There's no room for you. I'm full of hope. You won't fit. My hope is in God. It may look bad, but you don't see what's going on on the inside of me. There may be a storm out there, but there is peace in here. Hope in God. I mean, no life is better with God in it. Amen. Jesus didn't come to make life bitter. Jesus came to make life better. So have hope in God. Have hope in tomorrow. I like that. You say, Pastor, I, I, I'm a pretty positive person anyway. I mean, you may, you may be like me. I'm just an optimist. I just, I just look at things that way. But I'm not talking about optimism here. There's a huge difference between being optimistic and being hope filled. The difference is this optimism hopes for the best with no guarantee. In other words, optimism just kind of crosses its fingers and says, maybe things are going to work out. I hope so. Optimism is more wishful thinking, warm fuzzies. It's going to be all right. It's a pep talk. That's not hope. Hope is totally different. Bible hope is a confident expectation in God. Bible hope is looking at the promises of God and realizing that God is no respecter of persons. In other words, if he did something for you over here, I can stand up and say, hey, God, I'm next. Do it for me. Because God loves me like he loves you. If I read in the Bible that God moved in someone's life and he did a miracle, I can say, hey, God, what you did back then, why don't you do it for me right now? Bible hope looks back at all the times that God has answered my prayers and says he will do it again. How many know he never fails, right? He never fails. He always comes through. And so therefore I can have hope. And let me tell you why this series is so important and why we're talking about don't cancel hope. It's real easy because you cannot live life without hope. In fact, if you take hope away from someone, life becomes impossible. It becomes unbearable. It becomes too painful. Without hope, and we've seen it happen, and you know that it's happened, without hope, your mind will snap. How many of you have ever seen somebody lose it? Right? If you don't have hope, you will lose it mentally. It becomes so heavy. Your heart will break emotionally, and it will literally affect you physically in your body. It affects you spirit, soul, and body. You have to have hope in order to survive. In fact, the very first prophecy in the Bible was a prophecy about God saying, I'm going to send hope. If you go back to the very beginning with Adam and Eve in the garden and that whole garden scene, remember they had committed sin and, and they just messed up everything. They lost everything. They lost their relationship with God. They didn't have that closeness with God anymore. They, they lost paradise. They lost the perfect place. They lost their home. I, what, was, what was once easy now became hard because sin came on the world and, and, and there was a curse there. They had, they had one son that killed another son. I mean, they went from the perfect picture to a broken, messed up life. And the very first prophecy that God gave was this. God said, I'm going to fix this. I'm going to send a savior. I'm going to send my son. And he's going to take the curse off of this earth. He's going to reverse this thing. So what you've done, God says, I'm going to fix. How many know he still does that? That whatever you're going through, God says, I'm going to send you hope. And when I understand that, and one of my favorite verses is Jeremiah 29, 11, when it says, I know the plans that I have for you, says God. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. How many know God's for you, not against you? Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and to give you a future. God is always going to give us a message of hope. Listen, anytime the gospel is preached, I mean really preached, anytime the gospel of, is preached, it's going to bring hope and healing. I remember very early in my ministry, I worked under a particular pastor, and, and one, of the, one of the main things that he taught me when I had an opportunity to, to speak and stand in the pulpit, he'd always tell me every time, it didn't matter, when I get up to preach, he'd say, never use this as a whipping post. 
You never use this platform. You never use this place to beat people up and beat them down. This is a place of healing, and it is a place of hope. And I'm so thankful I got that message early in ministry and never forgot that, that we are dispensers of hope into people's lives. Do you realize that it is impossible to read your Bible and be a negative person? You just can't do it. There's so many good things in that book. There's so many faithful promises in that book. There's so many times that God has come through, even in possible situations, that you cannot read your Bible and come up with any other message other than God is for you and not against you. Look at this scripture, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We talked about this a little bit last week. We're going to go a little bit deeper today. But it says, since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love. And I could preach on this for, for an hour. You got time? <laughs> Man, it just went, I saw all the hope just left the building. I saw it right there. All right, I'm not going to preach on it for an hour. Get that hope back in here. Putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. The hope of salvation as a helmet. Here's the purpose of a helmet. A helmet protects your head. And what we're talking about today is not physically, but we could say a spiritual helmet that is going to protect our thoughts the way that we think, that negative outlook. Why? Because your thoughts, when you go through a storm, you're either going to have God thoughts going on in your head or you're going to have demonic thinking in your head. When I have God thinking, it means I have the ability to keep a God perspective of my problem. But if I have this demonic battle going on, this demonic thinking in my mind, it means I am letting Satan control my thoughts. And if he controls my thoughts, he'll control my life. There are people sitting here today that have a bad marriage simply for the only reason they don't think they can have a good one. Think about that for a minute. You've already given up and just said, there's no use. It's never going to be like I want it to be. I'm never going to have the storybook marriage. My marriage is never going to be better. Because you think you can't have a good marriage, you won't. When you have demonic thinking in your mind, it will control how happy you think you can be. It will control your potential and ultimately will control your success in life. So when I wear the helmet of hope, it keeps me from going over the edge. It keeps me from going over the brink. In other words, I'm not going to lose it because I always have the hope of God in my life. And when I put on the helmet, I know I may go through something, but I also know I'm not going to go over the edge. I'm not going to lose it. So the hope of salvation as a helmet, salvation is more, salvation is more than this. I confess my sin, invite Jesus into my life, and I go, I go to heaven for eternity. Now, thank God, that's good, amen. I mean, if that's all salvation were, that's enough. But wait, there's more, right? In fact, the, the Greek word for salvation is the word sozo, It has a very significant meaning because salvation is not just, and I don't mean to downplay that at all. It is not just asking Jesus into your heart, being forgiven of your sin and going to heaven. Doesn't get any better than that. That is primary. That is absolutely valuable, but there is more to it. It it is is an all-inclusive term, and it means several things. One of the things it means is this, deliverance from an impossible situation. I mean, if that doesn't describe the new birth, I don't know what does. You you were in an impossible place. You were lost. There was nothing you could do about it. You couldn't fix it. You couldn't get to God. You couldn't work your way to God, earn your way to God, beg your way to God. You were in an impossible situation. You were totally lost. But salvation fixed that for you. But even after we get born again, we still face impossible situations. We still face difficult times. Listen, as long as I have the helmet of hope, God will get me through difficult times. God will get me through the storms of life. I don't even need to buy the pastor's book. God will do it for free. I'm not much of a salesman, but you get what I'm talking about, right? So it is deliverance from impossible situations. If you are in, in your mind, an impossible situation, let God fill your heart with hope today. You don't have a God perspective. It ain't really impossible. You just haven't seen the answer yet. 
You just haven't figured it out yet. God will show you. So salvation means deliverance from impossible situations. It also means this, health and healing. Part of salvation is that God is my healer. Part of salvation is that whatever's going on in my life, God can supernaturally and is willing to supernaturally intervene. You believe that. How do I know you believe that? Because we get prayer requests all the time that says, please pray for this. If you didn't believe God could or would do something, why would you even write down and say, please pray? But because you believe that prayer changes things, because you believe in divine intervention, in health and healing, spiritually, physically, emotionally, whatever, you write that down because you know that God is faithful. Salvation also means the favor of God. Just God's blessing on my life. Amen. I love the fact to know that I can have God's blessing over my life and then lastly it means this it means prosperity in every situation that no matter what i go through if i stay with god if i hold on to god he will turn it upside down where i'm not the bottom but i'm the top he will turn it around where i'm not the tail but i'm the head amen i just got to trust god and walk with god and he always makes good on his word all of those things deal with with salvation now here's the thing about the helmet of hope you got to put it on it doesn't do you any good until you put it on we're not talking physically but we're talking about renewing your mind to the fact that god's for me not against me and not only do you have to put it on you got to keep it on right because here's the deal the enemy works 24 7 to cancel the hope that is inside of you And so it is my responsibility to put on the helmet of God, the helmet of hope, and to keep it there. So it tells me that I'm responsible for my own attitude. I'm responsible for my own outlook on life. How many of you here have ever failed? Amen. That's the one thing we all have in common. We, we've all failed. We've all messed up. We've all made these huge mistakes. But what happens when we fail is this, is that we relive that moment over and over and over until it literally paralyzes us. We, re, we, we relive that moment that we made this mistake over in our head until it totally robs us of hope. We nurse it, we rehearse it, until we are paralyzed by ever changing our lives. And that's why maybe for the first time, I really begin to fully understand when Paul said this, forgetting those things which are behind, forgetting those things which are behind, That may be one of the most spiritual things you can do here today is just say concerning my past, concerning my mistakes, then I'm going to cross you out. I'm praying for, you know, there are a lot of people that need a good case of spiritual amnesia. They just need to simply forget some of the things that have gone on in their life. Forgetting those things. I love this statement. It doesn't matter how pitiful your past, God has a forgiven future waiting for you. How many know that's true? Amen. If you've ever been told by someone or even the voices in your head that there is no hope for you, don't believe it. Can I just give you a quick punch list of the Bible? Listen to this. David was an adulterer and a murderer. And the culture around him said, cancel him. But God said, no, I think I'll use him. That's significant. Jonah was a hater and a racist. And the culture around him said, cancel him. But God said, no, I think I'm going to change his heart and change his attitude. And I'm going to use him. Noah was a drunk. Moses was a murderer. Rahab was a prostitute. And everybody said, you got to go away because you're not, you're not right. You know, we don't want to associate with you. Cancel her. And God said, no, I'm going to use her. In fact, do you, know, do you know how much God used Rahab? If you read the lineage of Christ, Rahab is in his lineage. She went from a prostitute to being part of the bloodline of Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, when God forgives something, he doesn't leave any strings attached to it. 
Peter was a backslider, and Paul said this about himself. Paul said, I am the biggest sinner that has ever walked the face of this earth. And everyone should say, cancel him. But God said, no, I'm not going to cancel him. I'm going to use them. And God won't cancel you regardless of your past. God will restore you and God will use you. That's good news for somebody this morning. Now, let me help you with something this morning. Our circumstances are never what they appear to be. So what does that mean? How many times has God orchestrated our lives and brought good out of evil? That's why I say, if you got a problem, listen, your problem probably ain't your problem. And that's not just, that's not just double talk. If you got a problem, your problem probably is not your problem. God's going to take that thing and turn it around. What Satan has meant for destruction, God is going to make something good out of it. Romans 8, 28, all things work together for the good of those that love God and that are called according to his purpose. How many know that problems are are a part of life, right? In fact, let me me just throw a few verses out there. These are verses of hope to to encourage you. And I'll just give you three or four verses really quickly here because I think think we're in church. We ought to get a lot of scripture to kind of help us out. Psalm 46.1 says, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Listen, whatever you're going through, God's with you. There's never a problem that you go through. There's never a temptation that you face that God is right there walking with you through that storm. He's an ever-present help in trouble. You are not alone. The God of the universe, your heavenly Father, is right there standing beside you through the situation and through the trial that you're going through. That ought to encourage hope in your heart. I like this one, Psalm 50 and verse 15. Call on me in your day of trouble. I will deliver you. That's what God is saying. I will deliver you and you will honor me. I will do something in your life that you have no, you'll have no other option other than say, whoa, that was God. I will deliver you and you'll say, whoa, Jesus. Yes, that was you, God. You will honor me. I love that verse. I love this one as well. Second Thessalonians chapter, uh, chapter one and verse six, God is just and he will pay back trouble to those who trouble you. You know what that says? I don't have to worry about people. I'm not fighting people. I don't have to get mad at you. I don't have to get even with you. I don't have to have a grudge against you. I just know that God's got this. God will fight my battles for me. You're not my problem. God, if however I have trouble, God will pay back trouble to those who trouble you. God, whatever's going on in my life, I just trust you to work it out. Amen. So you no longer have to play those, pray those prayers. God bless them with the brick to the side of the head. Amen, Jesus, you know. You don't have to worry about that. God's, God's got that. So here's where I'm going with this. All that encouragement. Why is that important? Because how you act in the problem oftentimes determines how long you stay in the problem. Do you have an attitude of hope or hopelessness? Let me show you what I'm talking about. We, we all know the story of when God brought Israel out of Egypt, right? And he was taking, taking them from that place to a better place. And if you go back and look at it on a map geographically, and every theologian has done this, they've mapped it out. No matter which route that they took, it was an 11-day journey from point A to point B. They had the ability to turn an 11-day journey into a 40-year spectacle. Why? Because of their attitude. They doubted God. They didn't have hope in their heart with God. They murmured against God. They complained against God. They had unbelief. They had a bad attitude. All of these things were going on in their life. All right, stay with me. Ever see the movie Groundhog Day? Kind of a classic, right? Great movie, fun movie. And you can watch it. But basically the concept is this, is there is a guy that is stuck in time in the worst possible place on the worst possible day of his life. And that same day keeps repeating itself over and over and over and over every day, the same thing that causes you to lose hope sometimes. I mean, sometimes life gets hard, life gets difficult. But listen to this statement and I'll, and I'll explain what I mean by this. Whenever you face a problem, 
The first thing that God will do, and this may be the most important thing that you hear today, whenever you face a problem, because this will help your perspective, whenever you face a problem, the first thing that God will do is not deal with your circumstance. The moment you face a problem, the first thing that God will do is he will start a work in you. If there's a problem, God says, okay, we'll fix that, but we got to fix this first. We got to get you ready. I, I'm going to begin working in your life. I'm going to begin working on your theology. I'm going to give you an attitude adjustment. Anybody ever, ha- ever had an attitude adjustment? I, I, I'm the youngest of, of four kids. I had an older brother. And he got a senior ring. And he would always turn that thing upside down and whack you on the top of the head. And he would call that an attitude adjustment. Yeah, I don't like him either. I've I've forgiven him, but I still won't go see him. (laughs) I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Sometimes we just need need our, our thinking changed. Remember a guy by the name of Samson? Here's what I'm talking about. Samson had lost hope. Samson was in a hopeless. Samson was in a hopeless situation. Everything that was going on, he'd lost his life. He'd lost his stature. He'd lost his title. He'd lost his strength. And every morning when he got up, he would begin to work around and just push this big stone around grinding mill. He just walked in circles every day, every day the same old, same old thing. But all the time he was doing that, his hair was growing back out. All the time he was doing that same boring, repetitive thing, God was doing something on the inside. It didn't happen overnight, but it happened over a period of time. And eventually all of Samson's strength was restored. And if you read the story, you find out that Samson did more to glorify God in his final hours than he did in the entire life that he lived before then because God did a work on the inside of him. God changed him. And the most important thing God can do today is that God can begin to change you on the inside out. All right, very quickly, because this is significant. Won't take but just a moment. But here's a great question. How do I keep hope alive? How do I keep hope alive? I'm not going to make a lot of commentary. I'm just going to read these pretty quickly. One is don't murmur. Or we'd say don't complain. See, oftentimes we have this idea, well, I'm just letting off some steam. I'm just, it's all innocent. It's not, it's not bad. Let me just tell you, murmuring is a sin. When we begin to complain about our life and what's going on, in essence, what we're saying is, God, I don't like you and I don't trust you. When we murmur and complain, God takes it personal. Because we are pointing a finger at God saying, you lied, you don't, you don't love me, you won't take care of me. And it's the ultimate insult to God. Don't murmur. Don't complain. Number two, don't doubt. Don't doubt. Don't let that into your mind. Every trial and every circumstance comes for one purpose, to get you to question God's faithfulness and to say, God, can I really trust you? And this is not a Dr. Seuss book, but this is important. Don't pout. Don't pout. Listen, I love the story of Job when everything went wrong in Job's life. He lost his family, lost his lifestyle, lost his crops, lost everything. He's lost his health. And everybody around him just say, man, you're you're crazy for serving God. Even his wife, even his wife said, won't you just curse God and die? Man, she could use some counseling. Amen. Won't you just curse God and die? Now, remember, Job didn't have a Bible. Job is, if you read the book, uh, uh, um, what's, the, um, what's the word I'm looking for? If you read the book chronologically, in other words, how it's written, Job is the very first book of the Bible, not Genesis, but Job. First recorded book of the Bible. So understand, Job didn't have a Bible. Job didn't have the Torah. Job didn't have books to refer to. He just had to kind of figure things out and have a relationship with God. And so even though his theology was wrong, here's what he said. His heart, you got to love his heart. Everybody's saying, won't you just curse God and die? Why don't you give up on God? Job stood up and Job said this, though he slay me, yet will I serve him. Man, that just gives me spiritual goosebumps, right? Though he slay me, yet will I serve him. And the last thing I would say is just shout. 
Now, I wasn't just trying to do rhyme time here. Those are powerful principles. And here's the thing. I don't think you realize the power of a praise. I don't know if you realize how powerful it is, how powerful it is that we praise God even in our darkest hour. How many know the Bible says that our reasonable service is to do this, is to live a lifestyle of praise? I want to ask you to stand with me this morning. And this next moment can really be powerful in our lives. And I want you to do something. And there's not a lot of fanfare with this. There's just something that, that maybe you need to do. And I'm going to ask you to do something. In just a moment, I'm going to ask us to raise our hands and I'm going to ask us to praise God. You may say, Pastor, you have no idea how much I hurt right now. But there's power in what we're doing. In fact, can we just right now, just lift your hands. Just trust me. Just trust God. Lift your hands. And just say, God, I'm hurting. But look at me. I got my hands up. God, my life is a mess. My mind is a mess. But here I am, God. I'm still praising. God, there's pain in my body. I don't even know what tomorrow's going to look like. But God, look at me. My hands are up. And I'm still praising you. Through the storm, through the battle, through the struggle. I may not know anything else to do. I, I don't know what the next step is, but I know the right step right now is to just lift my hands and say, God, no matter what, I will praise you. Because you don't fail, you don't falter, you don't disappoint, you've never let me down. There's never been a time that you haven't been there for me. God, look at me. I'm still praising. Can you just let hope begin to build on the inside of you? Can you just praise God even in the face of, of what is seemingly hopeless? Can you just go ahead and say, God, maybe it's your marriage, maybe it's your money. Maybe it's your health. Can you just put on the helmet of hope and say, I'm going to praise God anyway? I don't understand it, but God, I still believe. I don't feel it, but God, I'm faith in it. I'm just doing what I know to do, and my hands are up, and I won't be defeated. And God, there's a hope in my life. Father, I pray that you fill every heart with hope right now. God, I pray for that brokenness right now to be restored. I pray for that person whose mind is totally messed up. God, that you bring peace. Peace into their minds, peace into their thoughts. Father, I pray for that one that maybe on the inside are so wounded, yet let their praise overcome those wounds in their life. Father, I pray for hope to fill this place this morning. I pray for the hope of God to just go from side to side, from front to back. Father, that hope is being released into the lives of people, that we walk out of here today saying that hope is alive, that my hope is in God, that my trust is in God. I'm not going to look at what I don't know, but I'm going to focus on God is good. I'm going to put my trust in Him because, God, there's none like you. Come on, lift your hands and praise Him. Lift your hands and praise Him. Give him praise today because he's worthy. Just your own praise. Lift up your own praise to God. And let it be a God moment in your life right now. God, you're good. And I'm just telling you, hope is being accelerated. God is on the way. Help is on the way. God is showing up. Life is coming. Come on, God is reassuring some people this morning something's going on. 
in their life in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. 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 Let hope arise. Let hope arise. Let hope arise. Let hope arise. Amen. Amen. The hope in us. The hope in us is what reaches a lost and dying world. When they look at us and they say, man, you're going through hell on earth. How do you do that? The hope inside of me. Now, now let me share this. Just stay right where you are for just a moment. The book of Revelation. Wow, what a weird book. I mean, I've read it, I've taught it, I've, I've taught it in Bible school. I, I, I love the book, but there's some weird stuff in Revelation. And I've gone back and I'm kind of rereading some things that, that God has said. And I'm just going to say this. That book means more to me today than it ever has. And I'm going to tell you, we are living in a time like no other time. To live in a time where you literally can watch prophecy be fulfilled every night, every day, you're going to hear something or see something, and it just makes something stand up on the inside of you, and you just think, man, what is going on? And you just realize this is an incredibly exciting time. It's an incredibly frightening time. And I'm going to choose to walk with God through the storm. Amen. I'm here for such an hour as this, but I'm telling you something is moving and things are being accelerated on the face of the earth. It's not just me. There's a lot of pastors. There's a lot of preachers that just in, in, in blogs and blogs and conversations that are going on that God's up to something. And I'm just telling you, God's coming back. And we are closer than we have ever been. You say, Pastor, I don't know, man. I've heard all my life, Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. Man, they've been saying that from the beginning. Let me just let me just back up a little bit. Just before Jesus died, he said something. He said, boys, I'll be back. Give me three days. I'm going to go whoop some hell. And in three days, I'll be back. You know where the gang was when Jesus came back? They were nowhere to be found. Jesus said, I'm coming back. They weren't standing there with signs saying, welcome back, Jesus. They were nowhere. They were in hiding. They were running for their lives. They were far away. Nobody was there. But their unbelief, their doubt didn't stop the stone from rolling back. Jesus brushing off death and said, I told you. See, what we believe or doesn't, what we believe or do not believe doesn't change what God is going to do. Jesus said, I will come back for those that are mine. I will come back for those that have made me the Lord of their life. And I, listen, I, I would not manipulate because I, I, we don't, I don't bring people to Christ through manipulation. It's the goodness of God that draws men's hearts to repentance. And I believe if you paint a clear picture of either this or this, people know how to choose. But I just want to say this this morning. We're living in an incredible time. I mean, just in, in the last few months, things happened that I never thought I would see in my lifetime. And I can see what has happened, and I'm smart enough to look into the future to see old prophecies being fulfilled. So here's the thing. If you don't know Christ today, I promise you, there is no better time to start a relationship with him than right now. Than to just say, you know, I've been thinking about this. I've been kicking the tires. I've been checking it out. Listen, this is the day. Now is the day of salvation. And if you want to start a relationship with him, I want to pray for you. I want to help you get started because Jesus, listen to me. Jesus is coming back. 
I don't, I don't know what you think about when you hear that, but I'm just telling you, I, I, got, I, I can't say anything else other than I, I, I'd have to resign. I'd have to step down if, if, if I didn't say this. Jesus is coming back. Amen. Jesus is coming back. And I want you to be ready. I told you a couple of years ago, Jesus spoke to my heart and he said, I don't want you to give altar calls anymore. I said, I don't understand God. He said, I don't, I don't want you to invite people to come to Christ. He said, I want you to I want you to compel them to come to Christ. I want you to just with everything you have make the case for Christ. And so this morning, I'm just saying there is a God that loves you so much that he wanted to restore a relationship with you, that he sent his son Jesus to die to restore that relationship. Would you close your eyes for just a moment? If you're here today and you've never made the decision to follow Christ and you say today, I want to start that journey. I don't have all the answers. Listen, I don't either. But I know you got to start the journey. And you say this morning, Pastor, I want to start the journey. When you pray, would you pray for me? I'm not not going to ask you to come forward, step out, but right where you are, we're going to pray. I just need to know where you're here. Is there anyone this morning that would say, Pastor, I want to give my life to Christ today. I want to start that journey. Would you raise your hand up and hold it up so that I can see it and that I'll know to pray for you? Anyone this morning that says, I want to be a believer today. I want to give my life to Christ. Anyone? Anybody this morning that would say, I need to rededicate my life to Christ. I I need to get back. Man, I've I've gone left. And yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Look at me for just a moment. How significant is this? How significant is this? There are people, and thank you for your honesty, that just said, I've kind of grown a little bit casual. Maybe I've gone off course. But today I need to get back on track. I want to lead you in a prayer of rededication, of recommitment. I'm going to ask us all to say it together because I think we could all probably use a little more commitment. So would you say this prayer after me? And those of you that raised your hand, I want you to mean it with everything that you've got. Let's say this together. Dear God, today I come back to you to rededicate myself to your cause to you I'm sorry that I've let other things get in the way but Jesus God today I put you first in my life in my actions in my words in every area of my life Jesus be the Lord of my life I receive your forgiveness but I also receive your strength in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise God, right? Amen. Amen. Listen, every, every journey starts with one step. But I was 17 years old in a warehouse with my buddy. I gave my life to Christ. And I've never looked back. I just want to say I'm so proud of you for making that decision today to rededicate and say, what I started, I'm going to finish. Amen. Just stay standing. Let's worship God with this chorus before we leave here today.